the, the goal is to be the first Mexicans in Canadian. Well, no, Canadians have already gone up there. Right. But the original, uh, I guess, plan was to be the first Mexican at the North Pole. Okay. So now we have hopefully two Mexicans in the expedition. So that gives us uh, <laughs> twice as many chances. Yeah, the first two you know, Mexicans. If one dies, the other one will make it. <laughs> Is that filming right there, Enrique? Yeah. Okay. Names for the record, I suppose. Yeah, my name is Enrique Moreno. Okay. And Carl Thiessen. Okay. And Jose Aguilar. But I go by Pepe. Everybody else is right. Pepe. Pepe. Okay. So, uh, what is. Have you chosen a title for this documentary yet? I guess mm, there's a question. For no, you. not really. No, no, we haven't. No. Okay. No, we're, it's still tentative. work in progress style. We have, we have. As, as time went on, and this is history for you guys, uh, an American started pitching in money, it turned into the Mexican-American polar expedition. <laughs> but now we have a Canadian uh, and another Mexican, so we don't know. We, we, I mean, Yeah, we, we may play on that, that title a little bit, and I think well, we have about three years to figure it out. Yeah, and nationality, <laughs> apparently nationality is not going to be a, a, a factor, you know, not, not anymore. You know, okay. so. And um, can you go over just like what are your plans for going? Where are you planning on going? Okay. Canada? Okay. The, the plans here, they're not right, you know, set in stone right. yet, right? Because we still have to meet and and, and, mm -hmm. and talk and work together and see, you know, see what we're all about, right? But the plan is to go up to Baffin Island mm -hmm. to train for about a week or two. Okay. We might have to get an instructor, but hopefully not. Okay. Cool. That's my dad. You can you can cut stuff, right? Yes. Oh, uh, oh I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Este, no, it's okay. Este, so, one, two, three. Okay. So uh, yes, the plan is to go up to Baffin Island and train, especially get Enrique up to speed. Right. Okay. Uh, Carl's a Canadian. He knows cold. He knows cold weather. Yeah. Right. I've been up there quite a few times. Uh, Enrique, what's the coldest you've been in? Um, I'd say probably like 30 degrees. About? Or Fahrenheit. Below? Fahrenheit. <laughs> Above. Above. Oh, okay. Yeah, he definitely is. <laughs> yeah, because uh, we're talking about 30 below to 50 below. Yeah, that's a lot. Celsius or Fahrenheit? Celsius. Okay. Which is not so bad, but it's still pretty bad. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's still pretty bad. So, so are we go are we going to be referring to Celsius or Fahrenheit? I would say Celsius. Let's keep it metric. Okay. Yeah. I like that. All right. And that, that was 30 to 50 below? Yes, hopefully. Okay. Yes. And then if that goes well, which I don't see why it's not going to go well, uh, we our next step is to go up to Resolute Bay, okay, then from there ski to Beachy Island and locate some graves left behind by the Franklin Expedition. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was uh, from 1849. So they were trying to find the Northwest Passage across the Arctic so they wouldn't have to go around Cape Horn, you know. And, and that's a whole bunch of historical stuff that we don't need to get into, but. Uh, it, that would be a real good challenge for all of us to ski from Resolute Bay to Beachy Island and back, come back alive, and if that works fine, the next step is to land at the tip of Elmer Island, the, the north, northernmost part of Elmer Island, and then ski to the pole and back. Hopefully unsupported, no, no airdrops. We cannot even accept a piece of bubble gum mm -hmm. from anybody once, once we get off the plane. Yeah. So everything's pretty much riding on us being able to handle that right. that temperature and anything that comes our way. So. Mm -hmm. And how many times have either of you been to the Arctic Circle? I've been up there five times. Three times in Iqaluit, which is in Baffin Island. Mm -hmm. Then I try to cross the Bering Strait into Russia, from Alaska to Russia. Mm -hmm. But the Bering Strait doesn't freeze over anymore, so it was impossible for one man to do it, mm -hmm. right? And then I just got back from uh, last March from Resolute Bay in Cornwallis Island. Okay. So I've been up there. Right. What about you, Carl? None. None. <laughs> no trips at all. Um, I see, and sometimes that's what it takes. It just takes more the fucking desire to, get, to go there. <laughs> Right, than yeah. to be experienced because mm -hmm. you can be experienced and then once you get there you're mentally not even prepared so have the drive right the only thing that as far as temperatures growing up um, in colder temperatures average for winter was minus 30 to minus 50 and that was our winters that we were used to growing up so 
um, doing that and then also mountain trekking more mm -hmm. northern BC and those are kind of around the same temperature uh, changes but the the stages that you have to deal with as far as um, falling into crevasses it's still mentally tolling on you that um, that I feel that you know I, I would this would be a challenging trip mm -hmm. but I feel that I know where my limits are right now mm -hmm. and I and the I guess our next trip would be essentially to push ourselves a little bit further and more of myself as well to handle that kind of that distance okay in that cold and uh, Enrique you've never been to the Arctic Circle never, never. just read about it oh, okay. <laughs> Now, how did you get involved in this project? Through Carl. Okay. I met Carl through a mutual friend, mm -hmm. and he told me he was into film, and I was into film, so we just kind of combined forces, and now I'm here. Okay. Um, why don't you go into uh, like how long you've been trying to do this trip? Like how many years would you say? You guys are not going to believe this, but since I was 36, I'm 52 now. So oh. that's how many years? 16 years? Mm -hmm. I, I told my family on my 36th birthday, this is what I want to do. And it's been taking, it's been taking this long. Mostly because of money constraints and, and, and family. You know, my kids were little at the time, so I had to wait for them to you know, grow Girl. up a little bit. You know, so, so yeah, it's been 16 years. <laughs> it's a long time. And when did uh, you get on the project? I guess we started chatting about it last year. Um, early, was it early last year? Early last year. Early mm -hmm. last year. And I'm always up for a challenge. And anything when it comes to trekking, I'm, I'm always game. I love ice climbing. I love anything to do in the cold that that challenges you in any way. I, I like it. But, so I, and when I heard his story about what he wanted to achieve, there seemed to be uh, enough to turning this into a documentary and into a story mm -hmm. where, you know, there's time constraints and there's uh, dealing with trying to get funding. So there's all the elements to a story that we can, we can turn this into that, that is, I think something that people would find of interest to watch or would want to watch right. that. And uh, so yeah, that's kind of where I jumped on, and and then when while assessing uh, the type of difficulties and pros and cons of, of the trip and what we would come up against, then I, I realized that it would definitely be helpful to have another film technician um, helping out in some format. The hard part was going to be trying to convince or even see where he's at with dealing with. Wanting to make a trip up to the Arctic did Circle. You, did, did it take you a long time to convince him? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Have I have I fully convinced you? Yeah. Yeah. To about twenty minutes. About twenty minutes. <laughs> See, I mean, he instantly loved the the story. Yeah. And I mean, again, when it when it comes down to the story, it's really about Jose. Like, I think, sorry. Well, it's actually going to be about the three of us. I mean, yeah, I'm trying it, to. It's like I said, everything changed. You know, the the minute I agreed, you know, to be partners, then it's not about me anymore. Right. You know, it's about the two of us. And then we spoke about Enrique. We already agreed, but we have to sit down and talk to Enrique about certain details. Now it's the story of the three of us. Mm -hmm. There is no more uh, Mexican polar expedition. No, nah, it's it's. I don't know. It could be we give the explanation or three last names and that's the expedition, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned f you needed another technician for filming and uh, capturing the whole documentary. What obstacles mm -hmm. are there filming in such a place as, you know, the, the uh, Yeah, we, we're going to have a lot, I think, as far as, you know, the technical sides of the camera freezing over, dealing with frost even lining up or getting shots and since we're we're not working on a National Geographic's budget we don't have access to equipment and um, uh, things that will allow the cameras to run smoothly and not have to deal with the frosting of lenses and so I, I see that being one of our biggest challenges I think um, I don't know I mean we're, we're 
right now we're kind of researching techniques that we can do as on the budget that we're going to have to make it happen and actually document accurately without suddenly having anything well we have to plan that everything can possibly go wrong with the cameras in which case then we just have to document when we get back and part of the reason why the last year's expedition didn't get documented properly is because everything froze the cameras froze, the GPS froze, the, the, the batteries for the polar alarm system, they froze. I mean, you can actually warm up the tent and heat them up and they'll work, but for about a few yeah. minutes and then they'll freeze again. And then you so, don't really want to sleep at that point. Yeah, I, actually, I think they have the toughest job. You know, I think my main job is going to be the the, the, the principal navigator, right. right? And then we're going to have to probably you because you got more experience in the call to be the secondary navigator. Mm -hmm. But as far as uh, the film goes, I'm just going to be there to post like a model and do whatever they tell me to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So essentially, what we're doing yeah. is so we're going to be slingshotting. So as he's trekking in as we go, and basically we say, have to for instance, track um, ahead, I take the lead, the camera, set up my camera, get, get the shot, shot as Pepe's going this way, and then as I kind of match up, then he's going to have to cruise ahead mm -hmm. and get another shot. And then, but even doing that and dealing with the even just the controls I mean you we have to figure out how to do that without freezing fingers because at that point you're you're dealing with frostbite um, that can ensue within a minute mm -hmm. so and if you get frostbite on your any of your extremities you're pretty much hooped at that point everything kind of goes black and mm -hmm. yeah I mean from a previous trip I had have uh, my big toe has no feeling anymore because I completely frostbit the whole quarter side of my big toe. Like they didn't amputate, huh? No, I know, but it's completely um, the whole toenail, everything on. It's almost just like this, where it's just. Just mm -hmm. so, so you get an, another idea. When I was up in Baffin Island, I got caught in a blizzard, and I had to ditch, not ditch, but I had to go back to. He call it right away because mm -hmm. you know my tent wasn't working the poles were not retracting so i could i couldn't build the tent so on my way back i was skiing against the wind mm -hmm. my backpack broke so i had to ditch all my equipment all the equipment had to be ditched the only thing that i carried back to the town was my daily log my passport and my wallet and the skis by the time I got to town, it should, it should have taken me 45 minutes to get back to town, but because I was ski, skiing across, you know, against the wind, it took me about four and a half hours. By the time I got there, I couldn't move my hands, I couldn't feel my face, and my nose was solid as a rock, and I thought I was going to lose it. I thought my nose was going to get amputated, but luckily, I recovered. You know, within, it took me like six hours <laughs> to feel somewhat normal again. So when he's saying that he lost his Sensitivity in his foot. He's not kidding. It's, really? He got off easy, actually. Yeah, because it, it gets a little hard at that point because you feel like you're just dragging leg at that point. Like because if you've already lost feeling in your outer extremities, then the rest of your leg is just going to feel like a, a dead log just hauling. And that, and I was nowhere near close to the Arctic Circle, but we were dealing with minus I think about 40. And then you still have to take in mind you have a wind chill. Mm -hmm. So wind chill is going to make the the temperature seem that much colder. So they'll give you, okay, say for instance, a temperature of minus 40 with a wind chill factor of minus 70, yes. depending on how hard the wind's blowing. When, when you're skiing and there's no wind blowing, you, your body is generating heat, right? So you're sort of like inside a cocoon of heat, but as soon as the wind picks up, it blows that cocoon away from your body. Okay, when, in that time that I told you of the blizzard, mm -hmm. the temperature was about 30 degrees. The wind chill factor dropped it to 64 below. So, uh, it, it, it can get pretty gnarly. It can get really gnarly up there. Okay. Um, how much would you say an expedition like this costs? Uh, it depends. Uh, we're talking to Ecalloway, we're talking to Resolute, or we're talking to the pole. Uh, all the way to the pole. So to um, team up all the, if you're taking all every yeah, let's trip, say we're, everything. we're doing every trip and that's going to lead up to the pole, so you have to add that all up. I would say it'll probably be 
seventy-five thousand per head. Because uh, as the further planes have to fly, mm -hmm. the more expensive it gets. Because these guys, what they do, and they're experts at it, they set fuel depots uh, across the Arctic and small islands. So they have to land and refuel, take off, land and refuel, drop us off, come back and refuel, and refuel, and refuel. So, and that costs a lot of money. So we gotta have some real serious sponsorship for that. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully by the time we get to that point, we'll have some companies lined up with some philanthropist or something, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I'd say probably 75K per head. At least. You mentioned um, going going to train. You mentioned you gave a date uh, next March, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, how many trips like that are you planning on taking before you're going to tackle? At this point, there's only two. The one that we're going to do at Nikalawit, mm -hmm. and then if that goes well, then we go up to Resolute, and that's it. After Resolute, then the next game on. The game on to the pump. And and. Uh, each of us has different strengths, strengths and weaknesses, and we have to be honest with each other. At the end of each training session, we can either give each other the green light, or we might have to ask somebody, you know, I, I don't think that you should come the next time around because you might get killed up there. Mm -hmm. See, and one of the beauties about doing this solo was that I didn't have to worry about anybody, okay. just myself. Right? Now, now it's different, now it's three of us. Something can happen to me, Enrique, or Carl, and, and basically, since it was sort of like almost my idea, I would feel responsible for it. So if I see that Enrique decides, or if I see Enrique hesitating at, at 20 below zero and not wanting to get out of the tent and stay in the sleeping bag, then it's, it's pretty much over for him. Mm -hmm. You see, and the same thing for Carl, same thing for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying this to Enrique because he's the new guy. Because there's been times, you know, there are times where you're gonna go, I don't wanna get up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's too cold. Okay. <laughs> but we gotta keep going. And so um, it, it depends. It depends how far we get in our next training session. If the three of us pass, we get an A, we go to the second one. And if we don't get an A, then we have to rethink everything. Mm -hmm. But we're just not gonna go out there knowing full well that we're not cut up for it because we, we might not come back. I see. And that's really the, yeah. yeah. There's that, that looming factor that we were right. talking about earlier, and that's knowing that we're kind of all aware that the potential to mm -hmm. of death can, can is possible. There. On yeah, this. this is not going into Wisconsin or anything like <laughs> yeah. that, you know, or Tijuana. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so. and I think it, it seems more more subsent or more likely to to happen because we don't have. We're not going with a huge crew. We don't have the funding that, oh, well, if one of us gets hurt, we can just call in a rescue. No, if we call that rescue, and that's a good $10,000. Yes, because they will charge you for the gas. I mean, we have personal locator beacons, and you know, with the expedition, we have one. If something happens, all we gotta do is flip it on, uh, satellites pick up the signal, send it to the Coast Guard, and they'll send the rescue. But if we have bad weather, and the, and the, the helicopters can't find us, mm -hmm. we're hosed. Yeah. Right? And then if they decide it was negligence on our part, we have to pay for that rescue. Absolutely. And then you're talking to the tens of thousands, you know, it's just not Carlson. So. And that's, I, I think that's also what puts the intensity level on, on doing this and- And doing it right. And doing it right. We have to strategically plan everything, make sure that we do these pre-trips because we don't, we can't fall back on sponsorship and we can't fall back on hundreds of thousands of dollars that are at our disposal. So. Yeah, we can't fall back on prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all you out there, right? Yeah. I guess that's what uh, makes it kind of a good story also. Mm -hmm. It's the intrigue and danger. Yeah, there's definitely that intrigue and danger. Yeah. And by the way, we can supply photographs for you. You, you want okay. some photographs for the for the newspaper? We have oh, photographs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, definitely. I'll be sure to get them my email. In fact, I'll I'll I'll, I'll yeah, give you yeah. some. Uh, yeah. yeah, we got some photographs of of those past training expeditions. Oh, okay. And and unfortunately, they're not in in those pictures because we haven't gone out together as a mm -hmm. team. But I've been out there several times, and I can give you some photographs. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Anything that you can at least work with and. Yeah, <laughs> archaeology like aspect of this. Uh, is this something people have not done 
per se, going to the following, finding these Franklin expedition remnants? Oh, no, they, 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 they've been looking for the Franklin expedition pretty much a year or two when they failed to return mm -hmm. to England in 1851. And because of all those, uh, because of all those rescue operations, they were actually able to map out oh. the Arctic, mm -hmm. you know, before we had satellites, mm -hmm. right? So, so no, 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 no. Going and check out those graves is really no big deal because they actually have tour groups that do that. Oh, okay. Right? You land in Resolute Bay, you get a hold of a tour company, and they have several of them, mm -hmm. and they'll take you in one of those little skidoos or snow scooters, whatever you want to call them. You pay some money, they'll take you to the graves, and they take you right back. The only problem for us is that those graves are 100 kilometers away mm -hmm. from Resolute Bay, and if we really want to be boys about it, we want to be men about it, we have to <laughs> ski to it. Mm -hmm. If we cannot ski 100 kilometers and back and come back alive, we have no business yeah, in the Arctic Circle. It's yeah. pretty much just like a rite of passage, if you will. Mm -hmm. Exactly. To being able to, to even think of taking this trip up to the North Pole. Yes. And, and on a personal note, I teach physical anthropology, and I do talk about the Franklin Expedition and the Scott Expedition to the South mm -hmm. Pole that, you know, they're all ended in death, right? So one of my... I guess shticks, if you want to call it, is that I don't like to teach stuff that I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. But if I want to talk about the Franklin Expedition, I want to be able to tell my students, look, you see these photos here? I took them, and the team took them. So we know what we're talking about, not just regurgitating the book. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's about as much archaeology as I want to put into it. Right, okay. Yeah, you know. It gives you a, lot, a little more uh, validity yes. <laughs> when you're talking about yes. it. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it, all, you know, that we're going to be able to record it, mm -hmm. you know. So no, you know, if somebody can question, hey, talk to Carl, talk to Enrique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not just truth. one person. It's like, oh, you sure you took that picture? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we were all there. Yeah. Because yeah. nowadays you never really know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so as far as gear and like just clothing and equipment, it seems like these guys are they're wearing a lot stuff and they seem like they're carrying a lot what type of weight are you guys planning on like towing along with each of you without food we're talking about maybe just on clothing alone mm -hmm. i would say probably 50 pounds clothing alone would you agree yeah absolutely yeah because you know your clothing has to be layered you've got to have all this polar tech layers on you you got to have a wind a wind protector if the day happens to be balmy at 10 below zero you got to take off some of the clothing if it gets too cold then you got to put some more on one of the things you got to keep in mind Can't is that you cannot have too much clothes on because then you'll sweat yeah, the sweating is just all bad then you stop then the sweat freezes yeah in the clothing so it takes away uh the capability of it for you to stay warm and then you will you know get hypothermia and die right yeah, yeah so clothing is it's a real important factor it's the same thing in, in mountain trekking so even if you're in the arctic circle or you're up um doing doing a peak uh you have to pace yourself so you don't get you're not expending too much where you sweat and sweat and sweat and then when you stop you're just gonna freeze so is there something you can do if you do start sweating like usually you slow down slow down that's really the biggest thing and know that you layered properly okay. if you don't know your gear and you don't know your layers mm -hmm. accurately mm -hmm. and uh, adjusting them accordingly to what the temperature is going to be mm -hmm. um, that's I mean, that's the key so to it's, survival. It's a knowledge thing. Absolutely. You have yeah, to know your gear. You got to keep in mind that you're holding a sled. Mm -hmm. There's no dogs. So you are your own dog in a sense, right? And the sled is going to be weighing 200, 250 pounds, maybe 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. So you are going to sweat even at sub-zero temperatures. When you pull that sled, you will sweat. So you just got to play it smart. You know, like we said, if you sweat too much, your clothes are going to be no good. At night when you go to sleep, you're gonna be you're gonna be hot and warm in that sleeping bag, and your breath is going to collect in the sleeping bag itself. Mm -hmm. If you collect too much breath in it, it'll freeze. Then your sleeping bag will not work. See, there's a lot of tricks that you gotta know about all this stuff. That's why they got vapor barriers. I'm pretty sure you know about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> not going into Wisconsin. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that's, that doesn't seem like a cakewalk. It's <laughs> not funny.
Um, so, so what type of uh, funding are you thinking of going for here? Just um, private funding or sponsorships, corporate? You guys gonna try to use like maybe um, I don't know, like a website where you can get like stuff like that? Yeah, I think what we're what we've talked about is now that um, um, crowdfunding sites are mm -hmm. are now available to um, independent filmmakers such as our. Um, you know, Rick A. Uh, the possibility of that, we can do that. We can, um, we're going to pretty much talk to anyone that's willing to jump on the, on the bandwagon, bandwagon for helping support this cause and helping it happen. Uh, the hard, the hard sell part is the fact that it, this is going to be a three years in the making at least mm -hmm. to go to the North Pole. Again, if money wasn't an issue, we could probably do that trip maybe in two years, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, at best. Yeah, if even that's if we had the money um, readily accessible, that'd be two years. Yeah. Um, because we, we, we it, it, it's not just the cold out there that we have to worry about. We have to worry about each other's personalities and how each one of us is going to react in situations of stress. I might start break down, you know, I might break down and start crying, annoy Enrique, then Enrique is going to tell Carl, hey man, let's get rid of this guy. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of things. It's not just the money, it's not just the goal, it's our personalities. Right. Psychological, yeah. How well we can work as, together as a team without yeah. killing each other. So then we have to really um, suss that out. And so then we have three years to um, kind of get, get close with each other and understanding how we work and and how we operate as a crew, um, and that is also going to help kind of, um, when we're asking for, for money, because that's what we are going to be doing. Just um, we we can kind of we know exactly where the money needs to go and, and how to delve it out, and yeah. But we're we're really just kind of running through all our options right now, like whether it's Kickstarter or. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a business owner, you know, whatever we have available to us. Family so members. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Pepe, Pepe has pretty much decided that, uh, you know, come hell or high water, he's going we'll get to make the trek. So, and since we already have our gear, um, so we might as well just film what we can and film all the, well, the journey leading mm -hmm. up to the actual journey. Mm -hmm. Because this is the process. And the process is really trying to find money to do this when we're not a huge um, expedition crew. <laughs> then who knows? You know, if, if we get this going, who knows what might happen? We might even get the National Geographic involved in this. So we, we, we don't really know. Okay. You know. So, uh, but the first thing, like you said, is get to know each other. You know, because when the Franklin expedition failed, and not just the Franklin expedition, other expeditions. They resorted to cannibalism because they have no food. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure we have it, enough food. Right? Yeah, don't I eat like my legs. My legs. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's not just uh, it's not just the call. There's a lot of anthropology going in here. Mm -hmm. Personality conflicts. You know, yeah. it's like understanding the history of where um, our upbringing makes a huge well, and as. As Pepe can probably go into a little more detail. It's it's knowing your background, knowing um, how your body, I guess, essentially handles it due to um, your family history. Mm -hmm. and we gotta get we gotta get Enrique to the gym. Right. We need to get him to the gym. I need to start working a little bit more. <laughs> Pulling tires on the beach. And yeah, that's actually. The whole time, yeah. I've documented him walking on the beach with. Or he carries his tires. So he straps it onto a harness that he essentially be pulling, mimicking the right. logging pole and using the resistance of the sand and he'll just walk all the way down the strand. So endurance. Endurance is Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's what you're going to be training for. <laughs> the key, and, and these guys don't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm 52. Okay. You see? And you, how old are you? 31. 31? And 29. <laughs> So you guys are still pups compared to me. Mm -hmm. I'm 52 and I'm not going to handle stress as well as they will. But I will handle it really well for, for a 52 year old. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. I see you train in the gym. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a lot of endurance, yeah. And by the time we get there, I'll be the oldest guy on record, you know? okay, which is good. That, yeah. you know? I'll be the oldest one. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. You know? 
you got to do something. You got to you got to be somebody. You know. Well, yeah, for that age. Yeah. I, I think that's that's an added factor to the story. I you will so. be in your age category and the first one there. So uh, you obviously, you know, it's the three of you. You're working without big sponsors right now. Uh, have smaller crews done this and succeeded? Or to your knowledge, is this the not most that grassroots? We, it's pretty much, yeah, I think we may be, we may be one, of the, one of the first grassroots, at least that we know of. Mm -hmm. Well, when I tried to cross the Bering Strait in 2006, there was an expedition out there, and uh, they, and this guy, has been all over the place. Antarctica, Everest, all over the place. And they asked me what kind of funding I had, and I said, no funding at all. And, and then I asked him, how much funding do you have? And the guy goes, we have a quarter of a million dollar funding on reserve, plus all the money that I would spend getting there. They had the backup of the Prince of Belgium or something back there, and uh, helicopter backup, everything. They had to be rescued, as a matter of fact. They tried it. I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to do it. They tried it. Five days later, they, they were rescued because they couldn't cross the Bering Strait either. But uh, we're totally grassroots. We're basically nothing. We have nothing compared to the real expedition. Uh, so the odds aren't really in our favor? <laughs> no, they're not. At all? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> See the way it. If that makes you feel any better. <laughs> The chance that we could story. be, we're basically walking into death. <laughs> yes, we're actually tempting that. So you, you mentioned a time that's frame of when it's possible to actually ski there. What, what's the time frame? Like how long do you have to do this? You have, you have windows, right? Okay. Because of the changing of the, you know, the seasons, you know, throughout the year. Right. I would say for Iqaluit and Resolute, it's probably going to be the same window. I would say probably between the beginning of March mm -hmm. and the beginning of May. Those are the windows. Before the beginning of March, it's just way too cold. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and because of the 24 hour sun phenomena, right, due to the axis of the earth or whatever, we don't have a lot of daylight out there. And, and it's very dangerous and crazy and probably stupid to be out there when you, with, you know, with no daylight, right? So those are the windows. As far as the big trip to the pole, the window I think is a little bigger because it's further north but then again, it's further colder. It's, it's much more colder. So I would say, I would say probably between also the beginning of March and probably the beginning of June. And and chances are that on the way back, if it took us all the way to June, we would probably have to be rescued because of you know global warming. Now the ice breaks up earlier in the year. We really don't know at this point. Uh, there's no expeditions going out there. I think this was the last one, and that was like in 2006. Uh, I don't really know. But we do need to investigate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because of global warming, the ice conditions are going to be different now than they were 10 years ago. Right. So it's going to make it, yeah, it raises the stakes again, that alone. As you could get there and then come back and everything's... Right, right. and then we've pretty much a lot of money. Mm -hmm. A lot of money goes out in the journey. Mm -hmm. And we're not, you know, it's not helpful to just go there. Oh great, we can't do this and we fly back. That's pretty much all our hard earned money mm -hmm. going into this and as me and Enrique and this is our our pet project to document um Pepe and, and kind of our, our shot in for as far as our production company. Let me put it this way, when when I had to cancel the Resolute Bay expedition, mm -hmm. at the airport I called my wife and I was literally crying. Mm -hmm of the disappointment, the money lost, all the friends that support you. You basically, I hate to say this, even though they won't say it's true, you, you're letting everybody down. You're letting yourself down. Now, I don't know about you and you, but I don't like to leave, let myself down. No, I, I know you, you're a pretty good guy. You and I have, we go along the same lines, and I know that you don't like to let yourself down. Absolutely not. And if Enrique was crazy enough to join us, yeah, <laughs> same thing. So it's one of those things where, you know, if we're going, we're going, and we can't just, at this point, talk about it. It's just not good enough. Like I said, I've been on this trip for 16 years. What does that tell you about how serious I believe in it mm -hmm. and how bad I would feel if I didn't try it again? Mm -hmm. 16 years, you know, that's a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So in addition to just the normal supplies you'll be carrying for the sled, you also have to carry all the film gear and everything, right? Yeah. That's even more? It's a, it's a little bit more. Okay. I'd, I'd say it'll add to the weight, so we're going to have to plan for that because ultimately, I mean, food comes first. All right. Food comes first. And uh, so if we have to um, skimp on some of the... Or ditch some of the equipment up there. Yeah. I mean, worst case scenario, I mean, because ultimately it's it's about surviving and and living through as long as we can. <laughs> so you know what? If we're if we're down at that point and we're thinking, okay, there's no way we we need to start shedding some weight, then I'd have to say I would I would probably do that. <laughs> Don't bring your favorite camera. Right. Because I mean, ultimately, or or if it comes down to you know having to. If someone gets injured, one of us gets injured, we're going to have to pull that person. So we have to think about that too. And so we have to be, we have to think about everything along the way. Yes. So uh, what type of food are you going to be having up there? What are the meals like in the North Pole? <laughs> this is for history, okay? For, for, uh -huh. So you can record some of our history. At first I used to take frozen Mexican food that my wife and her friend Telma mm -hmm. uh, used to cook for me. But it's too much weight and polar bears can smell it. Mm -hmm. So that was very dangerous. So last last time I went to Resolute Bay, I decided to switch to dehydrated food, and which I think we should stick to that as a team. Dehydrated food, all we need to do is heat up water, throw it in the back of the food, stir it and eat it. You know, mm -hmm. we have, uh, the technology nowadays is really good where we can have, you know, I don't know, Mexican zucchini, mm -hmm. ch chicken a la king, all kinds of stuff, just like the army does with their MRE uh, food. So uh, unless the team has an objection, we're gonna have to probably stick to dehydrated food and bring in like little chocolates and, and, and candy, like Hershey's Kisses, mm -hmm. you know, with caramel inside. They're like my favorite three. Like you're gonna be skiing for but an you hour. Need, you need that like that blood sugar. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, you need those calories, yes. And there gets um, I did one trek where we pretty much it was a 48-hour trek due to poor navigation, got a little lost um, up in a mountain range, and we got down to I don't think any of us had any food at that point. I remember on one of my side pockets I found uh, like a quarter part of uh, an endurance bar mm -hmm. and I ate that and I could feel just the because we were down to absolutely nothing your body is just running off nothing essentially mm -hmm. fumes and you have that little bit and you can just <laughs> Feel the recharge, so you know that it, it makes a difference to, have, to what kind of food you have, and and the calorie dense type foods are going to be absolutely important. Mm -hmm. Getting the sugar level back up, so you can, yes. so you know you can just push through a little bit longer. So if we run out of food, well, obviously yes. we're we're done. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite things to do while I was up there, I would ski for about an hour, and then I would stop, take coordinates, and eat Hershey's Kisses with caramel. That was my reward for every hour of skiing. I would eat two or three, and that's how I kept it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, because you do get hungry. Your stomach starts to eat itself out there. Because remember, you're pulling 200, 350 mm -hmm. pounds, right? So you have to eat, you know, and you can't stop and eat all the time. So your food intake has to be scheduled mm -hmm. three times a day, and that's it. Right? Otherwise, you run out of food. Right? Mm -hmm. So, but those little snacks in between is what really you know, yeah. so you don't cramp up. So exactly. If you start yeah. cramping up, then you're still going to have issues. Okay. And, and we're talking about 7,000 to 10,000 calories per day. That's what you got to eat. Otherwise, your body will start eating itself, mm -hmm. and then you lose a lot of weight. And if you're not in good health, I mean, we're pretty fit, I think. Yeah. So we should be able to handle a 20-pound loss, 30-pound loss, right? But some people can't handle that. They, they, get, they lose too much weight. They weaken and they gotta be extracted. Mm -hmm. They gotta be pulled out. See, so the food is something that we as a team have to sit down and decide how much we can take, 
because the more food you carry, the more you're going to be hauling. The more you're going to be hauling, the more your body's going to degrade, right? So you have to find that fine line and how many calories do you need to function? How many do you need? I know that I need a lot, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's something that we have to sit down as a team and discuss it because all the food has to be weighed to the gram because you keep adding food without you know, keeping track of your grams and stuff, then you just start adding weight to your sled. See, as you can see, skiing on flat snow is a piece of cake, but skiing in places like that where you have all these crevasses and stuff, and they're pretty scary when you go over them. I'm sure you know that feeling. You know, is that's that's when I told you that you were you were gonna know what anguish is like when you start crossing to something like that. Broken, broken snow. You, you find all sorts of new curse words in your head. Oh yeah, <laughs> English and Spanish. Yeah. So, uh, going along with food, bears. Uh, have you had to deal with bears in the past? No, thank God. No, and I don't want to. It's like part of the reason why I was so reluctant to eat in the Arctic in the first expedition was because. I basically took Mexican food up there, right? And you start heating that food in, in, in areas like that, the wind carries that smell for miles, and bears can pick up on that, right? And uh, the, the thing about the polar bears is that they stalk you. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not just gonna growl at you. They're gonna stalk you and just pounce on you, and you're dead, right? So, uh, but we have a shotgun, you know, we'll, we'll improve on our, our alarm system. Uh, we'll even take turns at night, whatever it takes, you know, mm -hmm. to, Watching. yeah, because polar bears are nasty. They, they, they kill Inuit every now and then. By Inuit, I mean the local Native right. Americans up there, formerly known as Eskimo. But yeah. That's not a good name to use because it means eater of raw meat and it's offensive. Yeah. So Inuit means the people, right? Okay. So they, they get killed every now and then by polar bears. And they're natural to that area. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I know there's no Mexican food up there, so I don't know. About, I don't know. About, I don't know about Canadian, but Mexican food, you know. So yeah. I'm sure bears will be attracted to that. Yeah, yeah. Good thing that Mexican food burns on the way in and burns on the way yeah. out, huh? That'll be our revenge. Seriously. <laughs> so. You've been working on this for 16 years, so this is basically going to be the pinnacle of your expeditionary <laughs> pinnacle of my life. <laughs> like, this, is, this is your thing. Uh, I don't know, as far as you two, like, is this just the beginning? As far as, like, I don't know, extreme filming? I think this is pretty much a, a step up for us to take our filmmaking to another level, to a, a challenging point. Um, Again, you know, our gear is pretty minimal, but uh, <laughs> we're, I don't know, I mean, do you... I, I mean, if you ask me now, I would say, personally, it probably doesn't get more extreme than this, mm -hmm. yeah. but who knows? Yeah. Next thing you know, we could be underwater, like, with sharks or something. Yeah. I mean, I mean all these things you happen. You go from one extreme to another, so... Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, and an extra added uh, bonus that I forgot to tell you is that in the Arctic, another danger is orcas, killer whales. Uh, they're known to break through the ice and eat what be another problem there. Right? Yeah. So, uh, because they can sense the vibrations. Right. Because sometimes we'll be skiing on ice that is only a meter thick. Right. right? right. It'll right. hold our weight nicely, but an orca can just break right through it and then drag somebody down. So. That's the most terrifying thing I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's actually news to me too. I was like, oh, oh, all right, reassessing. <laughs> it is. It so is. when it comes to the extreme level, I think now yeah, we've pretty much hit the pinnacle of our extreme filmmaking. Yeah, if we get to do this, I give you my word that the rest of your lives it's going to be gravy. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's all down there. Yeah. It's going to be you know, gravy. Maybe we'll do. Uh, We'll do a peak, let's say Everest or nothing. Will compare to this. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is this is flatland, but it's a it would be completely challenging. Uh, I know, heard some stories of especially from old Arctic travelers that orcas will break the ice that you're skiing on, and basically play with you and eat you. If you look at some of this National Geographic 
documentaries, you see orcas training their babies to play with seals before they eat them. Orcas are very intelligent animals. I mean, they're called killer whales for a reason. Right? So it just amazes me that people try to train them. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. They're perfectly trained when they're born. So yeah, it's like especially in areas like that where, because sometimes the ice will break, and then you'll have open water. Right? And you got to be really careful there. You have to wait for it to freeze over. And I suppose that once it freezes over, like to a 30 centimeter thickness, you can ski across it right away. Right? But animals can break right through it and just take you down. They can confuse you with a, with a seal, with a sea lion. And uh, they'll get you. So, so, yeah, you have to worry about polar bears, orcas freezing to death starving to death, killing each other, cannibalizing each other, <laughs> and punching through the ice and getting underwater. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty much over once you go through the ice. Yeah, and so, I imagine there isn't exactly protocol for dealing with falling in the... We have to yeah. figure that out because, like I said, every time I've been out there by myself, uh -huh. now as a team, it poses different challenges. What happens if the last guy and the line breaks through, and the two of us in front don't don't see him. All right. He's got like what thirty seconds, a minute at the most. A absolutely. I mean, Does it because uh, there's a point in which um, when you have your gear on and you're trudging, it's you really only feel it's like you hear your breath, and your breath is so loud at that point because your body is just focused on surviving. So hearing other sounds seem is is very difficult. Um, and so him falling through the ice, you might not hear that. Yes, especially sometimes you have we gotta remember you got mask and then you have a hood. So you can pretty much caption everything on the front, but you won't be sometimes you can't hear anything from the back. That's why and we used to call them crazy Ivans up in the Arctic. You ski for a few minutes and you turn around, you stop and turn around. Make sure polar bear is not stalking you because you're not gonna be able to hear them. Right. So if somebody in the back of the team falls through the ice, you won't be able to hear him. And if the team is not used to this crazy Ivans, he's gone. You know, he's gone. You know, so you got to remember that you can ski on, on, on a patch of ice and it'll be stable. Then a second skier comes through and it weakens it. And then when the third guy comes in, it won't support his weight. And so you're talking about a 250-pound, 300-pound sled plus how much you weigh? Right now? Mm -hmm. I'm like 205. He's 205, I'm about 200. I'm 180. 180? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I gotta put on some more weight. What a nice weight. Yeah. 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 I'm a light weight. Right. See, so uh, it's not just freezing to death. You know, so. yeah. mm -hmm. Making sure we go in with enough body fat, too. Yeah. Really? So we have something to work with. Yeah. I bet you Rick is going, man, what the fuck did I get myself into? Like, Hold on. <laughs> I need to say, are you saying I need to do more California burritos? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And you can see how thin the ice there is. There you go. In fact, any time that the ice is blue like that, you know it's not that thick. I think this is the part where the guy goes through the through the ice as well. There's a part here where the guy here goes. We, okay. Uh, what were we talking about? Um, caloric intake and stuff like caloric that. Caloric intake. Um, a lot of calories. Yeah. Seven to ten. Well, I'm, I'm guessing the uh, dehydrated food that you're bringing is heavy and like it's meant specifically just to not necessarily for good eating. Yes, we, we are going to be taking food and equipment, mm -hmm. that, you know, the type used in Everest expeditions. Okay. We have to take the top of the line. Mm -hmm. Even, well, nowadays with the technology so available, you don't really have to spend a lot of money to get good technology, right. Right, to get good quality materials. So, uh, but yeah, that, that is one of the things that we have to sit down and we have to all go with the same boat, you know, as far as the gear goes. This is what we need, and no car, you know, those socks are going to cut it. Uh, Enrique, we need you to get this kind of a uh, sweater, whatever, you know. The, yeah. and, and I've been researching all the stuff, you know, from, like I said, 16 years, right? And uh, we're going to sit down, and we're going to say, okay, this is the gear that we're taking. Otherwise, we don't go, mm -hmm. right? Because the last thing we want is for somebody to get frostbite because they don't have the, the appropriate gloves. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. And everything goes black. Everything goes black and then amputation. So Yeah. And then if it gets bad enough and you cannot even set up your own tent. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine at forty below not being able to set up your own tent because you can't move your fingers? Mm -hmm. How long do you think are you gonna last? Yeah. yeah so. No. 
what exactly are are the tents like? Are they? I'm assuming they're special in some way. Like, and not so special. I mean, we, I, I'm using North Face. North Face, that brand is really good. Uh -huh. And it happens that the tent that I have, because I had the money at the time, I bought like a top of the line. You really do want to go top of the line when it comes to the gear. There's no cheating out on on anything where. You know, if you look for the brands that you know are trusted as far as um, outdoor right. um, gear, so um, OR, which is Outdoor Research, Mountain Hardware, the North Face, um, brands like those, I don't know if you can put any of those in or yeah. whatever, but um, going with brands that you know have helped support other trips like these or, you know, um, mm -hmm brands that you've seen where other guys have done treks up to Everest, you want to go with those brands. So it's not just that you're trying to copy them, but you're trying to copy them so the chances of survival are, are greater. And in fact, here's another story for history. Remember I told you about that blizzard that I got caught in? The reason why I got caught in it was because the poles in my tent wouldn't retract. The elastic wouldn't retract anymore, right? And I couldn't put it together. And that was a North Face tent but it was sitting in my garage for three years before I got to use it. And it never occurred to me that, you know, that thing being in the garage so, so long was actually screw me when I got to the Arctic at some zero temperatures, you know? Right. And something certain, as simple as that. threads are going to have natural wear and tear. Just even by sitting in storage, you now have to realize, oh, we have to update, we'll have to update our gear. Um, a lot of my outerwear I've done treks on two times and after that point when they said that it was allegedly waterproof after two treks and going through the mountains, you now need new gear. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just simple truth to it. So we'll have to, by the time we're making our, our North Pole um, trip, mm -hmm. we're going to have new gear. We're going to have to. Yes. Right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm still using the same gear I bought 15 years ago because I don't want to, number one, I have sentimental value to those sweaters and gloves and everything. And number two, I don't have the money to buy new gear. So I still, I'm still wearing, you know, the old gear. When I was up in, in, in the Bering Strait, talking to those expeditioners, the guys with the quarter of a million dollar budget, it was like an astronaut talking to an astronaut, right? These guys look like space shuttle astronauts, and I look like one of those astronauts from the 1960 movies with the silver outfit mm -hmm. and stuff. That's how much difference in gear there was. And they, they looked at my gear and they go, dude, what's wrong with you? And I go, no money. <laughs> but the gear was, was good anyway. I mean, the gear was not the problem. The problem was me. Right. You know? So. And I mean, they didn't even make it across either. They didn't get it across. No, in fact, I got their book. And in their book, uh, it's in the map where they got rescued. When I saw it, I knew it was going to be impossible for a one man. Now a two man with a helicopter backup. They had a better chance than I did, granted, but it was pretty obvious that it was going to fail. Mm -hmm. So they tried it, you know. They had the stones to do it, and, and that's very admirable, but it failed. Yeah. Yeah. Simply that's the way it is. Yeah. So yeah. We might have the balls to do it too. Yeah, it's just perseverance is the key. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> if we just keep working at it and working at it. Oh, I guess I'll go to each of you here. Um, what what do each of you think is your biggest uh, maybe fear or what you think you need to work on definitely for surviving out there? I know you've done this a lot, so uh, you probably. Hmm. For myself, I think the hardest issue is going to be dealing with you know probably managing the food issue. Mm -hmm. Because I just, I eat and I eat, but I also know that we need to watch the weight of how much food we can bring, so that's going to be my hardest, that's, I, I feel is going to be the hardest thing for me. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm scared of most is that we're going to run out of food, and obviously I'm, I don't want to have to cut anyone else's rations down, so. Or oh, anybody's legs. <laughs> or anyone's legs. I'm not eating human flesh. <laughs> this is the key factor here. I'm scared of having to eat someone. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't call that. Don't call that. Me? 
I would, I mean, the food and all the physical stuff is, it's pretty easy for me, but the most thing I'm concerned about is that during cold weather, my bones do tend to kind of ache. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious as to how my body would actually can um, deal with that. Mm. So I think the training would be a huge part of finding out. So do you have any broken bones? No. No, nah, that's going to help you. Huh? Yeah. Because I went up there a, a year after I broke four ribs in a car accident uh -huh. and they rebroke because there. of the temperature and yeah and every little cough you know so uh yeah i was sleeping on the ice with broken ribs and it was painful painful and, and you can't take vicodin yeah or or, or strong painkillers you because up. they'll constipate you I they'll see. do away with the pain yeah. but they will constipate you so now can you imagine being constipated for three or four days with broken ribs and then you got you got to push going to the bathroom with broken ribs oh, it's not fun not work, yeah. it's not fun yeah, yeah. So. I mean, I don't have any broken bones, right. but I do. My family has a history of like arthritis and that sort of stuff. But and you'll feel, you'll definitely feel that in a couple. Of yeah. That is. But I mean, if I can pump you, through it, you're still very young. It's yeah. more of a exactly. mental, thing. mental exactly. issue, yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, that's that's crazy. You you re broke your bones just from the temperature. Mm -hmm. They refractured up there. So previous injuries also, they uh, they come back. They come back. Mm -hmm. don't pull and pre previous frostbite will come back. Oh, yeah, I know that. And it's even worse, apparently, for what I read. Yeah. But when I was when I was up there, uh, after I got my nose uh, frozen up in, in, in Baffin Island, it was never, it was not a problem in uh, at the uh, Bering Strait. It was not a problem also at uh, in Resonant Bay. Mm -hmm. So, no, we should be fine. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you edit all that, edit all that, no all that noise out? This is shotgun, so it's okay. Good. It's directional. It's not obvious. Okay. Okay. And I mean, you, you seem to be a veteran, of course, of all this. So, do you think you're definitely prepared to take on the North Pole, or any concerns for you? <laughs> History again. Okay. And, and, and I know that it sounds like I'm bragging. That's why I don't really like to talk about this stuff because I don't like to sound like a bragger. But the truth is that last year. Look at the frosty kid. There you go. Last year, when I ended the Resolute Bay expedition, mm -hmm. I questioned myself, and I still do up to today, if I did the right thing or not, right? And my nagging doubt, did I give up too easy? Did I give up too soon? That's my problem. That is the, what I'm afraid of, that I might give up too soon. And, and, and uh, I know that logically, in paper, it was the right decision. But when I got home, it's like, maybe I fucked up and I shouldn't have given up. That's the only thing I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of the food situation, bears, any of that. This, this is what I'm afraid of. You know, so uh, some people say, well, maybe you didn't have the guts to do it. I don't know. It's not a matter of guts. It's a matter of beer. Mm -hmm. If you lose it up here, you lose it everywhere. You know, so uh, that's what I'm afraid of, to give up before, you know, before time. Other than that, I'm fine. And that's where I guess you know we have strengths and weaknesses. So we're all accountability partners. So as a crew, we have to. And it goes right back to like you were saying, we have to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. in order to make this successful. Yeah. So knowing that, you know, you, you can't just start arguing over petty bullshit anymore. Exactly. Because exactly. If, because some of us might be sharing pens at one time or another. Right. And if somebody is having stomach issues, and Spassing gas all night long, the other guy is gonna have to bury his face in, in the sleeping bag. So you know, especially with Mexican food, right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> spicy stuff. <laughs> yeah. And about this giving up thing is we can reinforce each other and motivate each other. Yeah. And as a team, we'll go further. We're gonna hit every high and every low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can only forecast that I, mm -hmm. since I haven't, I don't have. Uh, the history of the Arctic Circle tracks as he has. I can only forecast in, in what I've dealt with and use it relative to that no, situation. No, no, no. I trust this guy with my life. So that's just as simple as that. So, going back, is this 
the first time, this is going to be the first time you're not doing this alone. Yeah. 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 It's going to be weird. Do you think it's going to be a good thing having a team with you? Yes. That will help yes, you because I, I know Carl, I know you for what, two, three years maybe? At least, yeah. And we're very good buddies. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, a lot of people have approached me to let them in, and I've always refused. Mm -hmm. He's the first one who says, hey, you know, I'm interested in this. And it was pretty much right away, right? Mm -hmm. I said, okay. And every change we have had to make, okay? I took his word for it and I said, yes. You know, I, I trust this guy with my life. For some reason, you know. I, I don't know why, we've never been out there. But uh, he's a real good guy. So it's gonna be strange for me. I, I gotta be honest with you. But uh, it's for, I'm sure it's for a good reason. I'm sure it's for a good reason. And I'm sure it's gonna work out. Yeah, so, so yeah. All right. Um, I think I've gotten everything I need. So. Great. All right. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. Yeah.